a first-of-its-kind circular screen, a stainless steel casing that took two weeks to etch, and a Swiss-inspired mechanism that ensures it opens just as smoothly in 2020 as it did in 2008. I'm Mr. Mobile, and this is the Motorola Aura, a rare artifact from back in the days when phones were fun. Now, despite the fact that it comes from the same four-letter lineage as the Pebble, Sliver, Rocker, and of course, Razor, you probably don't remember the Motorola Aura, and there's a good reason for that. First of all, it debuted at the staggering price of $2,000 US dollars, or nearly $2,400 adjusted for inflation. On top of that, its launch in October 2008 was perfectly, terribly timed with the subprime mortgage crisis that kicked off the Great Recession. Launching high-end specialty phones into a market crippled by an economic crisis? Boy, I sure am glad Motorola's luck has changed. <laughs> oh boy. Now, the reason this pricey indulgence is worth a look, to me, is because it's the closest the mobile world has gotten to an heirloom product. Look at the phones I was carrying when the Aura launched. An iPhone 3G and a Motorola Renegade. Sorry, you have to say it like that. It's the law. Each of those, while great in its own way, was also made of the utilitarian stuff of 2008. Plastic, rubber, and the Aura bucked those trends. Take the housing. Instead of plastic, stainless steel with a PVD coating that's been chemically etched in a process that Motorola says took two weeks. The keypad, aluminum with a spin finish moiré that recalls the razor. And this display. It's not just that it's the first circular TFT LCD on a mobile phone. This thing had an effective resolution of 300 DPI, which was unheard of at the time. It would be another two to four years before screens of this sharpness became the norm. Just look at how beautiful this Apollo 11 medallion is. A very intentional out-of-box choice, by the way, which I'll explain in a minute. And what I love most about the Aura is that it doesn't stop at high-end features. It always sticks a flourish on top. This, for example, this is not glass. It's 62 karat sapphire crystal, very difficult to scratch, and it's not a flat plate, but domed. That means light refracts as it passes through, bending at the borders, making the display look even more like a physical object. Even when it's off, this thing is just fun to move around in your hand and look at. That domed sapphire was inspired by the world of the high-end timepiece, an analogy which continues around back. Take a peek through this window, as you might on a pocket watch with a skeleton dial, and you'll find a mechanism just as you would on a pocket watch. An honest-to-goodness Swiss-made bearing with over 200 pieces and hardened steel gears coated in tungsten carbide. Uh, an over-engineered way to open a phone? Yeah, absolutely. But as I said in the intro, it works just as well now as it did 12 years ago. And it's absolutely addictive, as Motorola seemed to forecast in its user manual. Repeatedly opening and closing the blade can inadvertently answer and end a call. <laughs> Basically telling you not to mess with it. We know it's fun. Don't play with it too much. That's right. It's a fidget spinner for rich people. Now, despite the heirloom potential of this hardware, the biggest reason technology doesn't get passed down through the generations is that it ages too quickly, right? You know, just take the camera. Framing shots through a circular viewfinder is fun, if difficult, and the sensor is cleverly mounted horizontally, so you can hold the phone upright and still get a landscape photo. That's a trick Motorola would bring back for some of its 2019 smartphones. But the fixed-focus 2-megapixel camera doesn't hold up. And hey, remember when you had to tell the phone that you wanted to save that photo you just took? Otherwise, it would go ahead and delete it for you? Yeah, good times. In my opinion, Motorola wouldn't get a handle on good software design until the Moto X five years after this. So you have this slow, unintuitive interface that you have to navigate with these tiny buttons. Even back in 2008, companies were already shipping scroll wheels on phones, Motorola included. So it's weird to me that the Aura, which lavishes so much attention on its circular screen, makes you muddle through with this D-pad for ants. In most parts of the software, the circular motif just gets ignored. Apps are square, the menus are just lists of texts, really just a lot of missed opportunities here. 
Folks, I did try to get the Aura working so I could make a phone call. I got a SIM adapter kit from Amazon, because back in 2008, SIMs were actually physically larger, and I charged the phone up until its embedded ring light glowed a steady green. But try as I might, I could not get the phone to see the T-Mobile network. Not that this 2G phone would be terribly useful for much longer. Eventually, even the storied GSM technology it depends upon will be sunset in favor of more modern networks. And that's why you don't see many companies making the effort to build phones as exquisite as this one. Sure, you had Nokia's Virtu handsets, and the Aura also recalls the novel Runcible handset from Monome, but Virtu got spun off and then went bankrupt, and Monome claims it's still working on the Runcible, but it's four years overdue despite the fact that they have thousands of dollars from gullible rubes like me. The point, besides you should be careful which Indiegogos you back, Technology just moves too quickly for anyone but the super rich to drop this kind of money on a fashion piece. That said, the Aura wasn't the failure you might expect. It spawned several variations through 2009, some with diamonds, some gold-plated, and this one, the Celestial Edition. Yeah, Motorola built this to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the moon landing, which the company had actually helped with back in 1969 as a communications vendor. So, this variant of the Aura came with custom wallpapers and ringtones, and reportedly, one was actually given to Neil Armstrong as a gift. I don't think it was engraved steely-eyed missile man, but I hope it was. The Aura is an interesting contrast to the last phone I featured in this series, Samsung's Matrix phone, which felt cheaper than it looked. The Aura is kind of the opposite, it feels even more expensive than it looks. Maybe that's the reason it hasn't depreciated in value that much since release, another rare achievement. We don't yet have a pocket watch of phones, or an heirloom of mobiles. But once upon a time, we sure got close, back in the days when phones were fun. Special thanks to Motorola for loaning this handset for this video, and sorry friends, it's not for sale. In fact, it'll shortly be on a truck back to Chicago. As usual, of course, Motorola got no copy approval or early preview of this video. They're seeing it for the first time right alongside you. And speaking of device loans, I lucked out and got a handful of exciting ones for episode three of When Phones Were Fun. So make sure to flip out your screen and point your hip top to that subscribe button, because next week we're checking out the T-Mobile sidekick, and you're not going to want to miss it. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe at home for now, but in spirit, Stay mobile, my friends. Yeah.